Welcome to This Is Not About Your Body, a body neutrality podcast where we talk about all the real shit body image issues are actually about because they are never just about the way you look. I'm your host, Jesse Neeland, and today I have with me my friend Rachel Kimsey, who is an actor and voiceover actor, a former personal trainer and yoga instructor, an amateur homesteader, and a mother of three. And Rachel's whole story is super interesting, and I hate to have a whole ass three-dimensional human on here just to talk about their experience as a parent, but I do realize that a lot of my listeners are parents trying to navigate food and body neutrality, both for themselves and for their kids, and it's a super complicated and super important topic, so I'm really excited to have Rachel on here to talk about that. So welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much. It's really fun to be here. Yeah. Uh, Okay. So why don't you start us off by sharing a little bit about your journey to becoming a parent? Like what was that decision like? How did the experience compare with expectations? Was that something you always knew you wanted to do? Um, Yeah. I love the question right off the bat because it was absolutely a decision for me. Mm. It was not a, a foregone conclusion. And like the big joke is if you had asked me 10 years ago, I'd be like, I'm the cool aunt. (laughs) <laughs> I was in being a cool aunt. Like I have, I'm one of five kids. Um, my my kids have uh, a dozen uh, cousins. Like there's, I come from a big family. My my mom's one of five. My dad's one of seven. Like that's it's a it's a big crew. Yeah. Um, and what I realize in retrospect was I know how big a deal it is to have a family, and so. I was just shut down on the idea unless I had the partner that was the right partner for me. Like it just, it Mm. didn't register as a thing that I was going to do until all of a sudden I was like, oh, that might be a thing I want to do when I was in a relationship, but it wasn't one that was conducive to that, which made me separate from that relationship. And then I realized I'd rather be alone or with somebody who will do it as a full and complete partner to me. And there is no middle ground for me. Um, Okay. So the topic of pregnancy and body image, I know is something that so many of my listeners and my clients struggle with, whether they're in it now, they've been through it, or even if they haven't done it, but they're like really anxious about going through it. Um, I've obviously never been pregnant myself, but I've coached many folks through the experience. And I know that it's it's different for everyone, but I would love to have you share a little bit about that experience for you. Uh, body image through the changing stuff of pregnancy and postpartum and all of it. So I was never a person that like, couldn't wait to be pregnant. Like I remember, mm. so I was raised in a very conservative, religious, authoritarian, patriarchal culture. Um, that has like a default of large families and lots of babies. And, Mm -hmm. and so I, the ethos around me and lots of the, the girlfriends that I had around me were like, I can't wait to be pregnant and feel that life inside me. And I remember very clearly being like 22 and going, that sounds horrifying to me. (laughs) And that that shifted over time. But I do remember feeling starkly different from the people around me and that, that in that this thing they were excited about just seemed terrifying and off-putting mm. and foreign to me yeah. and I'm very grateful for my mother who had five babies um that when I mentioned this to her she was like there are other ways to have a family like I give her a oh, lot that's yeah right? that's a cool answer you don't have to come out of your body if you want to mm-hmm. and I was like oh and I give her a ton of credit for that sensitivity and yeah it's for like I can see where you are in this mm-hmm. um and eventually, you know, my mind changed and I, I had some wild pregnancy experiences personally. And if you asked me to say, did I like it or not? I would say yes. Um, one of my pregnancies was excruciatingly painful, hmm. excruciatingly painful. One of them was kind of like, I guess I'm pregnant. I su- I su- guess. <laughs> like, uh. <laughs> um, and the one in between was sort of in between and that um that pregnancy there were some complications that had emotional stress even though physically like it was fine and I'm also going to acknowledge a privilege of like I had no fertility issues I was very 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 to get pregnant each time I chose to be pregnant and Mm. not to be pregnant when I wasn't wanting to be pregnant and that is so lucky and not a given 
for people at my age. And having come out of the space of my body is my job, visually right. actor and physically and performance wise as a coach and a trainer and a yoga teacher, my first trimester of my first pregnancy was so disorienting that I like I've made a point of talking to other people about it. I was like so there's this feeling where you know that you're pregnant but culture says you're not supposed to talk about being pregnant mm-hmm. because you don't want to burden people with your grief if something goes wrong yeah but we didn't do that I, I specifically told everyone that whose support I would want if something oh if if we had a miscarriage we'll just use yeah. the word um <laughs> I told those people like I need them to be on my side in case I need their support and I was very fortunate that was not the case um and there's this weird feeling where I'm like my body doesn't feel like my own anymore hmm. it's not doing anything weird yet but it's not behaving like it was sure it doesn't look pregnant uh-huh. Somehow we have this idea that pregnancy looks like a giant baby bump, even right. though it's only at the end. But it doesn't look like it used to look. And even if that that isn't a self-consciousness or a like, oh, I'm, you know, judging myself over my appearance, just the foreign nature of like something shifting. And right now it's shifting slowly enough that maybe no one but me notices but I don't feel quite like myself in this space plus I'm really tired and maybe you're sick and like the things that you used to do to nourish yourself don't necessarily work anymore and and the emotional baggage of like well do I take my vitamins every day and what do I Mm -hmm. eat choline every day or do how do I serve myself and there's all of this stuff that happens that sometimes can be extremely disorienting even though it's a positive choice that you yeah, have yeah. yourself, ideally by choice or even accepted if it sure. in your circumstances right in my case it was an active choice um and even with all of that there was still this feeling of like I don't feel like me yeah and am I gonna feel like me but pregnant Cause I don't mm. feel like me with a baby yet. I just don't feel like me. Yeah. And it's a really strange experience. And I remember battling, especially the first time it, for me, it lessened over the next two. Um, but especially the first time I was like, I, I want to tell people I'm pregnant, not fat. And yes, then- I've heard that from so many people. But yeah. That I was like, how could, how could, how could I think that about myself or about other people? like putting that thought on them or thinking that about me and and what it really comes down to is the fear that our society doesn't have any compassion for women's bodies changing right at all right it's that that fear of like like oh I don't want to be judged for changing because you're actually going to think it's great as if the idea of gaining a little weight is yeah or like being bloated or any of the things that are yeah So what's interesting to me about this is I always tell people, I think a lot of people, my clients especially, are really surprised to hear that all body transitions are disorienting and require some processing, and they can be uncomfortable even if the transition is into something that sort of is like, quote unquote, positive. So if somebody's trying to lose weight and they lose weight, there's still a weird disorienting transition there. Um, We obviously focus on the negative experience of that transition in body image when it's a change that they didn't want, like a health change or weight gain that feels, you know, like something they didn't want, whatever. But it is just a weird identity experience to have a changing body. And when those body changes happen quickly, like in pregnancy or side effects to a medication or any of these things, like it, it's just bizarre, and bizarre stuff can be uncomfortable to process. Yeah. And and especially when, as you say, like, even when it's a welcome change, even addressing the thought, I, I am changing and that is uncomfortable, can feel like, can feel bad in itself. Even addressing that mm. thought, like, oh, does that mean I don't 
really want this? Does that mean that I'm not going to oh, be, wow. that I'm not ready? Does that like, even that can, Ooh, I never thought about that. Some stuff. And, and it happens again, postpartum, right? The baby comes out, however it comes out. Mine were all um, in stages down, traumatic to less traumatic C-sections. It's not at all what I wanted. Yeah, I went for those. I wanted to be like unmedicated home birth, uh-huh. and I ended up with a completely medical experience, and it was that was traumatic. That yep. that took therapy time. I recommend. Sure. Um, and then you go home, and you're and no one is there to support you. <laughs> there's no, there's no like if you have built yourself a support, you have it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you're fortunate to have fortunate enough to have a doula or a mother or a mother-in-law or yeah. women. Cause it's usually women to come in and support and hold you during this time. And maybe not. Yeah. And you're looking down and you're like, I'm pretty sure that the 10 pound baby is out, but there's all of this space that still exists and it doesn't feel full anymore but it doesn't feel connected back to my skeleton yet. Ooh. Cause literally your organs have to find a place to go back to, and they may not wow. go back to where they were beforehand. You wow. might have a completely different, like slight shuffle of what's in there. If you're like me and you've got internal stitches in several places that you can feel, there's this, like, I don't want to be aware of my internal organs. And yet here I am. Right. Right. And then on top of that, I chose to breastfeed and um, six years later, three babies that are still, still at it. Or, or all <laughs> um, I chose to breastfeed and it was both wonderful and very difficult. And there's no one there to help you. Yeah. There are lactation consultants that you have to go to. Yeah. But this baby is with you from the first minute yeah. and all day. <laughs> so when things are hard and you're like, isn't this supposed to be the only thing a human does is eat and sleep? And yet somehow eating and sleeping are like yeah. the two hardest things. You're like, I can't get them to latch or I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. Or my boobs. I was like a an A cup person until my 30s when suddenly I was a C cup person. And then I had pregnancy. And then I was like a triple E cup. I was like, what is even happening? And <laughs> and like engorged and over milk producing, which isn't something you're allowed to complain about because underproducing is such a terrible and yeah, it, right, right. Can't complain about overabundance, even though it's painful and difficult and yeah. <laughs> and makes nursing hard and nobody talks about it. So there's no resource. The, the lack of structural support for women, birthing people, families in our culture should be more shocking Yeah. before you're in it. <laughs> and even though I have lots of siblings and sisters-in-law and nieces and nephews, still when I was in it, I was like, there's nothing here. Wow. And I think like I have a mother and a mother-in-law who came and supported that I get along with, right? Not even yeah. everybody in that relationship. Like I got like 10 days from each of them right off the bat. And I acknowledge that gratefully. But even then at a certain point, it's like, you got to just do it. Yeah. And now my, I used to pad my bra my boobs get in the way of my elbow transition <laughs> like oh nobody prepared me for this or like so there's a massive shift in identity even even with without even just addressing like the body image and the beauty ideals and the whole thing you've got just this massive shift in identity around sort of like the role and purpose of you and the role and purpose of your body. Basically, the minute you get pregnant, you have more rules. You have different, like things start to shift even before you're taking care of anyone. And then after you are in charge and handling things in a very different way, navigating like a brand new identity as a parent. Um, and in the middle of all that, I do feel like there's something to the sort of 
um, romanticized or fantasy driven idea that it should be easy or it should be beautiful and magical or like that there would be almost something like wrong with an individual who is struggling or suffering because I, I do think you, even if you were pretty plugged into this world and you'd seen people go through it, but my God, if you hadn't, especially like the idea is that's what you're built for. It should be easy. And it's the most rewarding thing you'll ever do. So I could imagine that a lot of that identity stuff gets really hairy in those moments. There's, there's stuff about worth and value and, you know, even if you know it's not supposed to be easy, you're like, but it's supposed to be natural, right? Mm. This, is, this is what my body was made for. This is right. what we are supposed to do. And then you go, oh, but I'm also supposed to have a community of people around to guide me. Like I, mm. I'm supposed to have observed other people nursing babies into toddlerhood so that I have learned from that socially oh, as yeah. well as experientially. I am supposed to have a community of people to allo parent with me so that yeah. you, so that a, a, a new parent can sleep when the baby sleeps. We say that phrase, yeah. but you can't do that if you're also the only person responsible for the mental and emotional load at home because mm -hmm. one partner is working in one partner's home or God forbid two or six weeks in America, you're back to, yeah. um, I mean, unless you want to be back to back to work right away because we don't have any support to be able to stay in that moment. Like these these platitudes that we offer about how natural it is and how beautiful it is and how how instinctive it is only yeah. come true if you're also supported by the things that support that. And so there can be a ton of um, difficulty with should I have done this? Am I worthy? What's my yeah. value? If it's not easy, yeah. even if you're just exhausted because sleep deprivation does appalling things to your brain, yeah. your self-concept. Like being on drugs, it's an altered state. Yeah. And, and if you're not remembering to nourish yourself, I'm pointing at me <laughs> um, as you're so busy nourishing someone else. If you yeah. don't shower more than every 10 days I'm <laughs> because you're caring for someone else, like the, yeah. the level of self-care that so often just goes out the window, um, even under the best circumstances can then separate you so much from your identity as a human being outside of Ooh. the nurture of this tiny thing. And then Jesse, we're still talking about infants. Children remain your children for 20 more years. Right. And this idea of being a mother is like, well, we love to talk about babies, but then it's like, Oh, well, now they're kids. So like, just deal. <laughs> right. Talk to a mom of a teenager. And they're like, it's the last time somebody was like, Hey, being a mom's really hard. Right. And they're mm. like, yeah, no one talks to me about that anymore. They, they well, want to talk interesting. in the adorable clothes. Right. They're the, the shift in the needs to address and the unparenting and reparenting of yourself and the addressing of your own stuff as your kids grow into this stuff that you ran into growing up, right? Yeah. Like those things will continually change and continually challenge your self-identity. Um, I have, my, my daughters both have red hair and my oldest daughter has red, red, red hair. The kind of red hair that means that strangers touch her in public. Oh. The kind of red hair that means that we cannot go anywhere in public without somebody commenting on her body. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to acknowledge she is not being judged negatively. Sure. She is not being um, put down. Yeah. She is not being pitied for a disability or something, right? And yet, from infancy, I said, oh, people are going to talk about my child's body. Wow. Without her consent and wow. try to touch it without her consent. I have to get on top of this now. Yeah. I have to develop strategies now. Yeah. One of my other kids has a, a birthmark on their body that there is, there was never a time that we went someplace that somebody didn't go, oh no. And ask mm -hmm. about it. And so I was like, I need, he's fine. Yeah nothing wrong with him there's nothing wrong with his body even beyond there's no judgment of it yeah, yeah but I was like 
oh, I need to get on top of this now. I need to know what to say to kids, which is different than what I say to adults. Sure. Right. To kids, for him, it would, it's, it's, well, that's just how his body is made. Everybody's yeah. bodies are made differently and that's how his body is. It doesn't hurt him. Yeah. To adults, I say, are you talking about a, a child's body? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. I, like, and it's just like, I'm like, are you talking about his body? And they're yeah. like, and, and, oh, oh yeah. Yeah. You know, the first time that I was sexually assaulted, I was five, six, seven, really little, 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 because I was a pretty little girl that people felt like they could touch in public. And I go, oh, it's not too early to teach children. Yeah. It's okay to step back from someone else's touch. Yeah. To not oh. the person who insists on a hug, to not kiss the uncle who wants that. Uh, it was none of my uncles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but like those things, right? To it's teach like, bodily oh, autonomy, wants, yeah. Someone wants to snuggle, like go, the, this person at the park wants to hold your hand, right? Like it's never too early to teach a kid about bodily autonomy and consent in a totally age appropriate way so that they're not a six-year-old going, I don't know what I'm supposed to do now because no one told me I was allowed to say no. Wow. Oh, Rachel. Ugh. And to have a five-year-old or like whatever, whatever age, I mean, I could imagine that being like a second wave of processing nightmare. And and the thing is, like, I've done a lot of my own work on my own stuff. And I'm grateful that at this point, it means that I'm aware that similarly to in anti-racist work, when when we are told by Black parents, like, white people, you don't have the privilege to not talk about race because we right. don't have to not talk about race. And I go, okay, I have to remember consciously to do that because I sit in the privileged place of my yep. kid is on the default, right? I have the awareness of this other thing to talk about consent and bodily autonomy and saying no to an, a, a, an authority figure if it is the right thing, because I have the frame of reference to know that it's never too early. Yeah, yeah. And here's the good news. It's also, it doesn't have to be a big deal. Right. Like my kids... Um, we practiced consensual diaper changes from the beginning. Oh, wow. And it's is that a hard. thing or did you like, is that like an established thing in the culture? I've never heard anyone say that. The The way that we did it. Um, and again, I, I, the parenting caveat is always right. This works for us. What works for you? Sure. <laughs> Everyone has their own language. Maybe I will learn a better way later. Uh -huh. um, what, what worked for us is we would describe, I mean, from birth, we would describe what we were going to do before we did it and wait for acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing something like a diaper change, that is a non-negotiable, I am caring for your body. That's my job yeah. is for health and safety. I'm going to do it. Yeah. But I can get your buy-in. I can make sure that you feel safe first, I, you know, and, and what that looks like for a newborn is it's time to do a diaper change. And so I lay you down right. gently. And I contact and then for me my ritual was we would use um the asl sign for change because it was something that was easy for a kid to see uh -huh. and then they always were like oh here's the first the first clue right they're doing this gesture and say making eye contact and then i would always tap on kind of like the belly button area of the diaper to be like this is the part of your body i'm gonna touch and then i would tap mm -hmm. on one step so i was like i'm gonna open this side and tap on the other mm -hmm. one and open this side then i would tap on the center and say now i'm gonna open your diaper and i'm gonna clean you and from early on, I would ask for them to help lift up their bum, right? Yeah. And of course, a newborn can't do that. Right. It's like a lot of lip service, but it's setting a foundation. Setting a foundation so that within like two or three weeks, you can see their little butt muscles clench going, oh, I'm participating. And by oh, like, yeah. eight, they're like, you can see their little feet pushing down, uh -huh. trying to like lift because they're starting to engage their body because what they are doing is engaging their body and learning about the world. And by the time they're, you know, six months or nine months or a year, they're helping unstrap the straps mm. and they're helping lift their butt. And they're, you know, at two years old, they're starting to 
some kids get through potty learning faster than others. <laughs> <laughs> they're connected to what's happening in their body or they're asking for a change because they would need their body to be clean. Yeah. Like you start with the things they want. Nobody wants to be dirty. Yeah. So, okay, I'm engaging you in this diaper change and I'm not just going to do it while I'm looking away and I'm not going to do it as fast as possible. Like my personal experience, many parents have a different experience. I only got peed on once or twice by each kid. Hmm. I wonder if this cultural standard we have of like, you open the diaper and they pee in your face is because a diaper gets opened and a body gets cold and their body goes, whoo. Mm. Maybe I just got lucky. Yeah, yeah. In my experience, having them engaged with me meant we neither of us got surprised by the experience very many right. times, right? And then for me, one of my great joys is letting my kids dress themselves. So from like, you know, from the from like week two when they're not always in zippies covering yeah. up, right? I'm like, do you want this shirt or this shirt? And when they're a baby, it looks kind of like, where does your eye linger more? The blue mm. or the red? Okay, I can follow your eye contact. By the time they're three and they're like, I like this. This is what yeah, I like. Yeah. Right? Then they are expressing bodily autonomy. They're expressing control over their environment. They're expressing, they're offering self-expression. They're, they have a voice in their own life. So if somebody else was to come in and say, hey, you have to do something this way, at the very least, they would question it. Yeah. Because they're used to having a voice in their own life. That's so, so powerful. And I feel like in the most fundamental way, uh, you're just talking about treating them like a person from the time they're born, but it's actually like wildly uncommon, it just really extraordinarily rare. Treating them like a person from the day that they are born, an individual person with their own tastes and desires yeah. and autonomy from the day that they are born. And it is so out of our cultural standard. Yeah. And there are more and more people embracing it. And I'm grateful. I am not like some point of the sure. sphere on this issue. I am very grateful for the people that I've learned about some of these things from because my parents loved me. My parents took good care of me. Yeah. This was not the standard in our home. So this is all learned from my end, right? Yeah. This is all learned stuff. It's it's relearning and reparenting and unparenting, right? Um, But it all comes from you are a person with your own tastes and desires. That goes to food. That goes to your physical space. Yeah. That goes to the kinds of shoes that you want to wear on your feet, right? Like for my family, we practiced um, baby led weaning because it just made sense for me mm -hmm. um, to feed them food and mm -hmm. let them experience food instead of processing it down to a puree. Other families make a different choice and it works great for them and I support it. I think all three of my kids' first food was like some kind of steak. <laughs> they're gnawing on uh -huh. and like, they didn't get it off but like they it was like oh here's the iron that you're that you're not getting because breast milk doesn't have the higher levels of iron in it mm. that you need so it's not a surprise to me that they all kind of reached for yeah. a meat something uh -huh. you know but that also means that when you know they're a little bit older and they are not reaching for the green vegetable on their plate today I'm not making them take two bites of it before they get yeah. on the ball. Okay, so this is this is a huge major topic and I just want to introduce it properly. So I know that you and your partner are committed to creating uh, to the best of your ability a food and body neutral environment for them early so that they have less shit to unlearn later, less likelihood of having like disordered relationships with these things. I also hear now having just gone through that other exploration of bodily autonomy, how much of it is the empowerment of them as humans to mm -hmm. be embodied, to have self-trust, to have a sense of their own like uh, right to boundaries and uh, autonomy and all these things, right? So that to me feels like maybe a missing piece of the conversation in a lot of the areas where people are talking about like how to raise intuitive eaters or, you know, like how to how to have food neutrality with your little ones. Cause that's a part of the internet. And there's a lot of really great providers out there doing that kind of thing. 
And I, I do think there's probably touches on this, but I've never heard it so succinctly put all as one, like teaching them to be whole people requires an intuitive eating approach or a food neutral approach because it requires and body neutral as well. Like it requires that they understand, Hey, you don't get to touch my hair just because it's a really cool color. Hey, you don't get to tell me, uh, stuff about how I look or whatever, because that's not appropriate. And also what are you doing? Like there's so much in this that is a much bigger question than just how do you keep your kid from developing an eating disorder? Right. Yeah. And, and fundamentally, I hope, <laughs> um, it all comes down to, do you know yourself and can you trust yourself? Yes. And, um, if you know and trust yourself, will that be enough when bodies and culture inevitably transition around you? Because right, right. bodies will inevitably transition, whether it's puberty or uh, an injury or the culture just shifts from, you know, we all had to be skinny in the 90s to everyone had to have it a, a butt in the yeah. in the 2010s. Like when things mo- shift around you, do you have enough self-compassion and and self-knowledge to be full of of the love of who you are yeah Um, and part of that is um allowing them to make choices that align with what's important to them today like I had a conversation with some parents over the weekend where I (laughs) Jesse it's so weird the things you need as an adult as a human mammal to survive are your (laughs) And food and sleep are hard. They are hard. Um, and I was having a conversation with some some fellow parents in a group that I'm in um, over the weekend. And somebody was just like, and and then my child, you know, eats fruit at this time and fruit at this time and fruit at this time. And, and I could see them like saying it out loud and starting to feel really like self-judgment. They're like, and of course, I mean, I know it's a problem because they're addicted. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. With love and compassion for you, I have to push back. They are not addicted to fruit. Fruit is food. And like everyone kind of took a break, like this like moment. And it wasn't like I'd said something so wise. It was just, it's an interruption, right? Of what the culture tells us. I was like, fruit is food. And the kids we were talking about at this moment are all like transitioning three to four. I was like, this is a time where their bodies need energy. Fruit is full of energy. They need that energy to grow. If you are offering the things that they need, that they can choose, give them the benefit of the doubt that they will choose what they need. And if this day, this week, this month, what they need is quick energy food, give them the benefit of the doubt that that's what they need. I feel like screaming right now because I feel like fundamentally... This is, I mean, it's it's so mind-blowing in its simplicity, but you are modeling for your child in in a way that is like incredibly radical, but shouldn't be. You are modeling that you trust them. Yeah. That's it. You are building an empowered, embodied, self-trusting, self-knowing child simply by saying, I trust your body. If you are reaching for these things, uh, assuming, I I guess, that you're probably providing a variety and they're just choosing from there. If you are reaching for these things, I trust you. And what most people teach their kids totally on accident, I'm guessing, because I don't think anybody's thinking, oh, they can't be trusted. It's just, it's my job to make sure that they eat, you know, the healthy things according to my standards or whatever, which tells the kid without ever thinking about it, I don't trust you or your body. You are not a reliable source of information and you should listen to me and not you. Right. And that sets us up for basically me having a job. Like that sets us up for all of the things in all of the body image and disempowerment space, right? Well, and here's the thing, like the caveat to that is of course, the human animal sometimes wants impulsively, especially, you know, small children impulsivity is a hallmark of childhood it's also how they learn it's also how they gain experience and there's a time and a place for guidance but in my 
family, what that guidance looks like is, hey, let's take a little break and I want you to check in with your body. Do you feel like you want quick energy right now? Or do you feel like this will be gone if you don't have it? Because that was something I was raised with, right? Oh, scarcity. Yeah. Like I need to get it all right now because if I don't get it now, I'm not going to get any. Yeah. And so one of the things we talk about is let's have some and then you can have more. Mm. So some and then more, I was like, we're very explicit with you can have as much as you want, but let's start with some. Because a lot of times they'll discover that once they've had some, they're actually good. Yeah. That's enough. Um, but the feeling of scarcity will often cause yeah. that, that grasping um, response, right? Yeah. So even just slowing it down and saying, hey, you can have as much as you want. Let's start with some. Yeah. Um, and And again, like everyone needs to know their own kids. Some kids, their energy systems can be out of whack. And this is not something that'll work on day one. We've been practicing this since birth. So my kids are in the practice of listening to those body systems and energy. As if, for instance, two days ago, one of my kids asked to make brownies. So I just said, yes. And that night the bigs wanted to have a brownie and then another brownie. And we were like, are we going to just let them have as many as they wanted? And I was like, you know what? have a brownie. And it turned out they both wanted about one and three quarters brownies. And they both <laughs> wait. And the youngest wanted about half a brownie and then like to feel what it felt like to mush it. Mm. Would anyone have come out better in that circumstance by me saying, you can have one, one is plenty. Mm-hmm. Right. Then it creates a feeling of scarcity. It creates a feeling of the forbidden um, it adds to this yeah. this drama of the thing. So and- this is a huge aspect of intuitive eating and the binge restrict cycle that is so much of the healing work that I help adults do and unlearn later. You are basically giving them the space to not have to unlearn it later because you're just like, okay, well, check in. I mean, even just give yourself a bellyache. You don't need to do that too many times before discovering, you know, that that it's not worth the thing. So it really is just right back to like, this is how bodies work. They're pretty, they're a self-regulating oven in a lot of ways if we let them be. But the minute we start interrupting it, the minute we start making certain foods treats or rewards or having that scarcity around certain things and and having rules around others or making the external source, the authority on your body, like now the whole system goes haywire. And that's where you're going to see kids and adults like sneaking food, binging, or, you know, being sugar obsessed or whatever it is. And so part of that means that like, in our life, we don't make dessert every day, but also if I do make dessert, it's probably going to be put on the table with dinner. Yeah. And a lot of times my kids will eat the dessert first. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they'll only eat a little bit of it and then they'll eat their food. And sometimes they'll come back to it and sometimes they won't. And, um, It does also mean that sometimes I forget that not all families operate that way. And when I get around another family and I put the cookie on their plate with their dinner Uh, and the other kids in the room were like, yeah, are you kidding? (laughs) It's, it does not create an equitable space in that room. Right. And then I have to decide, okay, is it more important to me that I feed my kids the way that I always feed my kids or that this is an equitable space? And so usually when I catch myself, I'm like, oh, you know, not all families have their treat with their dinner. So we're going to wait with the other family because that's what works for them too. Or sometimes I'm like, oh, sorry, dude, I already put a cookie on their plate. And the other mom is like, I just go get a cookie. (laughs) (laughs) Like it, it goes both ways. Yeah, There's a difference between what happens in our home and what happens at large. Right. Um, and so sometimes we have to accommodate for those things. And there are some times where, you know, I'm like, Oh, maybe I shouldn't buy the $10 box of raspberries in November, but I did. And I don't want to see you waste the $10 box of raspberries. So I'm going to give you two at a time. Yeah. 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 Expensive. And it's okay to also say waste is not a value that our family upholds. So I'm not going to let you 
like just smash this one into the table yeah. because this is food yeah. and somebody's going to want to eat it. So I am curious because I know that the pudding like dessert food on the same table at the same time as dinner food is one of the principles in the intuitive eating book for like raising intuitive eaters. I'm curious if you follow any kind of framework or principle system, or if this is all just stuff that, you know, you've kind of like cherry picked and works for you. I've definitely cherry picked. Um, there's, there's a woman, um, who runs an account called kids eat in color that I learned a ton from, uh, because unlearning and unparenting is a lot. And so I've learned a lot from her. She's a dietitian who's also, um, yeah a parent um and she's a parent of picky eaters and so it's also really helpful to be like oh just because you know stuff doesn't mean that your kids won't become picky eaters because sure. i it's not about you as yeah. a parent your kids are their own people uh-huh and so when some of my very um broad palate eaters suddenly contracted mm-hmm. i was like oh this isn't something i did wrong this is a moment this is a contraction period yeah which doesn't mean it's not sometimes infuriating. Oh, I just I bet. validate the parents that are like, why would you eat food? Because sometimes it is infuriating. Yeah. Um. And so you got to figure out the system that works for your family to get through that moment. But I know that like my kid who ate every spice under the sun contracting down to a minimal amount is also part of developmentally the body shifting from... I am provided nutrients by an adult to, I am the size body that goes out and explores in the world. And so if I put everything in the world in my mouth, I could die. Mm, <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. Like there's this moment. That there's a brain development aspect. Most yeah. pellets contract. Hmm. And the theory is that evolutionarily it supported us from like, Oh my gosh. And then it re-expands. And maybe, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not, but it certainly helps me get through yeah. this. Yeah. This isn't forever. Just to have a story to explain it, yeah. I'm like, I'll I'll take a story if that's what it is. <laughs> um, and so, whatever system works to help take the emotional weight out of it, yeah, is the one that works. I was raised in the 80s and 90s when fat was bad and margarine was good, and mm-hmm. you know, and my mom was being the best, most healthy mom possible by giving us margarine and skim milk and Same. you know stuff I have that- like a lifelong vendetta against skim milk because of it <laughs> dude it's gross like what? it's it's it, no, it sends gross. me into a rage skim milk um you know and and my mom was a, a stay-at-home mom who you know cooked 99 percent of our meals mm-hmm. and all those things and it's still those choices are not choices that I am making now yeah um and everyone is doing their best yeah. right I also was very lucky to not have a ton of food issues that weren't just sort of like the broader cultural food issues yeah 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 so some of it is trying to get um to stay out ahead of that so that other people's stuff doesn't get written on my kids. Yeah, totally. And it's easier to see when it's other people's stuff. Yeah. Um, a huge part of that is I made an absolute commitment to myself that I would never, ever diet in front of my children. Mm. And that when you are a year post birth and your body looks different than it ever uh-huh. had while being pregnant or before, and people are asking you about it. Mm it's a hard commitment to make. Yeah. Um, and I'm but very, it's so very proud. powerful. You should be proud of it. Like it is just, I think this is something people struggle with so much is when they are trying to raise the kids in the best possible way. And maybe they do have a history of eating disorder, disordered eating, diet, culture, body image issues, any number of things. They know what it looks like to have a parent model certain things. So they are trying really hard not to, and they're still in it. Yeah. And that back and forth, I just, I mean, I work with people in this position all the time and it is brutal to feel like you're failing on both fronts Mm -hmm. catastrophically because like to give yourself that little bit of like, oh, I'd like to, I'd like to restrict a little, or I'd like to look different, or I'm feeling bad about my body, or I'm talking about my body this way or any of these things. And then knowing directly 
this moment makes my kids more likely to deal with what I'm dealing with today. And the thing that I would love to offer them is just not available. And here's the thing. The answer is treat yourself the way you treat your kid. The answer mm. is um, eat what feels nourishing to your body. And that may or may not serve an exterior principle. There was a time I'm going to fess up um, after my second pregnancy where my body didn't feel good. I was in pain every yeah. day. And a dear friend of mine who's a fitness professional was sponsoring this like fitness challenge. And I was like, you know what I know about myself? I know that when somebody says show up, it's easier for me to show up. Sure. So I signed up for this fitness challenge and I was like, I don't want to win. I am not interested in any of the things. <laughs> to tell me how to move my body every day, which means I will remember to move my body every day. Yeah. That's what I haven't been doing to serve myself. I need to put myself back on the list of adding me to the people I take care of. Ooh, yeah. And when I won that contest, it was very disorienting, Jesse, because I didn't want to. And I realized that there was a lot of value in putting myself on the list to care for myself. And maybe because I didn't care about that other thing, it worked yeah. in my favor. And to be fair, it was not exclusively about numbers changing, which was yeah, good. Yeah. I didn't. Um, but putting myself on the list and then I had, but then I had to deal with the emotional. I was like, oh, was that a diet? I was like, uh -huh. it, how did I talk about myself during the uh -huh. time? That's what I came down to. And I was like, how, the way that I talked about myself was mom, this is mom's 20 minutes to move her body. Mm -hmm. Okay. I feel good about that. Yeah. 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 Like we are going to make sure to carve out this time that you can do this every day. And so yeah. we called it mom's 20 minutes to move her body. And I was like, oh, I can, that's okay. Yeah. 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 I can live with setting that precedent of moving your body is joyful. Yeah. I needed it to take care of me. And some days it was hard and some days it was easy. And the food that I was eating, if my kids asked, which they didn't, because why would they? Because we didn't model talking about your food. Right. I could say, this is the food that feels good in my body right now. Yeah. And meant some days when they were having dessert, they'd be like, mom, do you want a cookie? I was like, I don't want one today. Yeah. yeah. But Jesse, sometimes when I make cookies, my kids don't want a cookie today. Yeah. The number of times that I'll put like a little treat in their like lunchbox to, to um, preschool that some of it or all of it comes back. Hmm. It's not a zero sum day. Like you know, it yeah. happens. Not every time, but it happens regularly because they're choosing the thing that they want because they're used to choosing the thing they want. Yeah. So even that one time when I was like, oh, I did this thing. Did I violate my values? I was like, wait, yeah. how did we talk about it? I talked about the food that made me feel good. And I talked about moving my body because it was my, this was my time to move my body. Okay. Those are values that align and are good. And I don't feel like we undid anything in that. Right. And so yeah. going forward, we stick with that. Treat yeah. me like I treat my kids. <laughs> Feed them yeah. a broad and nourishing opportunity for food. Move your body and take opportunities to be outside and move my body. Yeah. Those are things I make the choice to offer my kids. Yeah. <laughs> to offer it to myself. I, I need love to that. Myself. I also think like it, it, feels to me like because this fundamental underlying thing of autonomy and self-trust is being modeled that you probably could diet without the same kind of repercussions. I'm not advocating. I'm just saying like you could probably go a direction with your own stuff that would feel utterly different to your children and have a totally different impact than most children who are hearing their parents talk about these things in a super disempowered, somebody else has the power over me kind of way. Because again, we're really going back to like, the reason most people don't trust their kids' bodies is they don't trust their own bodies because we've all learned that the authority on our bodies lives outside of us, whether it's like a specific person or institution or plan or diet or whatever, or it's just sort of a vague sense that you're not a trustworthy source of information. And I feel like, you know, you, this is why when sometimes people will ask me, like, what about the role of discipline or what about, you know, um, whatever? What if I want to do a thing to get healthy and prioritize that for a while with food or exercise? I'm like, yeah, once you heal the fundamental disempowered feeling that you owe the world something or that other people 
um, other people's opinions matter more than your own or other people are more trustworthy than you are, like you can play and do whatever. It's not, I'm not against any of these things. I'm not against uh, like building muscle or losing fat inherently. I'm against the fact that most of the spaces that we do this lead to disordered uh, relationships with ourselves, our, our worth, our bodies, and end up like tanking our mental health. So really what you're talking about is modeling, this was a choice I made and it's what I'm doing right now because that's like, it's all inside of you, right? If you were to be like, oh, I'm, you know, trying to eat healthy because <sighs> Weight Watchers, I don't know, like any any other factor, right? Or Or even just mommy needs to lose weight, which definitely places the authority into a real vague, weird external space. Just even even owning it in that place inside of yourself. This is what I want. This is what I'm doing. I'm doing it for me. This is what feels good. This is what self-care looks like for me right now. I think that changes everything. And it's, um, it's, it, it makes it easy to talk about a lot of, a lot of different kinds of care that way. Um, Mm. I have two, um, female bodied children. So I am also trying to normalize periods Sure, sure. whatever comes in and what that means is um having children you you just lose all privacy <laughs> <laughs> you know at some point you know each of them has walked in on me in the bathroom because they just do that jesse i gotta yeah. say if you ever want to have your bathroom to yourself don't have children um, <laughs> And so then I'm, I'm explaining, I'm like, oh, I'm not hurt. This is something that my body does. And this mm. is what our body may do mm-hmm. that, that it probably will do in time. But that it also means that on some days I go, you know, I'm going to go into the bathroom and I'm going to lock the door because I need to take care of my body and I want to do it all by myself right now. Yeah. Yeah. And they go, oh, you're going to go take care of your body. I'm like, I'm going to go take care of my body and I want to do it all by myself right now. Like, it's just... I don't want to change a cup with my two-year-old watch. I don't don't want to. It doesn't, I don't feel good today. Which Um, by the way, this is a moment that would be so shame inducing. Go on, say that. A five-year-old two days ago say, oh no, mom's going to go take care of her body for a minute to my two-year-old who's just like, but, but she take care of her body and she'll come right back. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. So I feel like the 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 default around something like this with privacy is shamey, right? It's like that you don't want someone there because you're doing something gross or you're doing something embarrassing or any any of these things that kind of create shame around the body. So even just again grounding it in autonomy, this is what I want to do right now. This is what would feel really good and right for me it takes the shame out of it. And it's like just super accurate. It's like a very accurate picture. That's what I want to do right now. And that's the thing is like, like accuracy and specificity. If I had to come down to like the two through lines of what I've discovered are my parenting values is Mm. you are a person from day one and telling you the truth is what is going to get us all to where we want to go. Which means, you know, I I will tell you about my period if I'm having it. And mm-hmm. sometimes that means like I discovered there's one day where I just get mean and I don't like that about myself. But I like finally the self the self-awareness clicked. I was like, oh, this is the day mom has a really hard time. Mm-hmm. So I make sure that our environment is prepared. So I am as as little triggered as possible, right? That's my job. Yeah. And then being honest that I'm having a hard time today is what I will share so that we're on on the same page, right? Um, I am going to tell you, this is a quick energy food and this is a slow energy food. Mm -hmm. You might feel better if you have a slow energy food because we're going to go do some stuff or quick energy food is a great idea. We're about to go for, go play at the, you know, running up down the right. a great idea. You might sleep better if you have some slow energy foods because that'll be slow energy to yeah. get you through the night. Let check in with your body, see how you feel. Yeah. Right. Um, talking about how bodies change. One of the phrases in our family is bodies change every day. 
<laughs> right now my kids' bodies are growing. Yeah, yeah. And they look at me and they're like, are you and daddy growing? I was like, I'm not growing anymore, but my body is changing every day. Bodies change every day. And so some of that is, it gives us a framework to talk about what we do see or what we do, yeah. you know, when a pet died, we didn't use euphemisms. Yeah. We in a big emotional state because it was a big surprise. Um, mm. all right. yeah. um, we were like, let's talk about what is and then allow you to grieve and experience that. Yeah. And I'm not saying pet death and human death are the same, but I was very surprised when two years later, my grandfather died and my daughter was incredibly receptive to my grief because mm. it wasn't knew and she was a she made space for my grief in the same way that we made space for the other grief because it didn't happen in two days for a year she was sometimes go sam's dead sam died he did he died i love sam i miss him okay and then we move on yeah that's true right our bodies change every day that's true this food is a quick energy food that is true cookies are that is true right oh my gosh if I let uh, you are you don't know but I know if I let you eat more than two oranges it makes your bum hurt <laughs> the little they would get diaper rashes if we had yeah, yeah. An orange tree in the backyard and if they ate more and they loved the the oranges because they were easy to peel and it was this mm-hmm. amazing moment of like they could do this thing yeah if they more than two they'd get a diaper rash and so I had to set a hard limit of no more than two oranges in a day. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with the orange. Yeah. But I, as the grown up, know that it's not going to be good for you. Yeah. So I'm going to set this limit with kindness and compassion. You so want that orange. But yeah. what I know that you don't know is it's going to hurt you. Tomorrow, we can definitely have an orange again. Yeah. And so it's, it's offering the things that are true. And sometimes that means really looking at the scripts inside of your own brain that you've never thought about. Yeah. I there are things that feel true that aren't because <laughs> it's what you learned. Totally. And that is we have to confront all the time. Yeah. But it's wonderful. So there's something so beautiful to me about the similarity between offering your offering your children like specific and accurate information and offering them like the cookie with the dinner because essentially what you're saying with both is I trust you with this and then you know they get to make decisions to an extent within a container and there are certain things as you say that are like well my job is to you know ensure xyz so that's what we have to do but even that is information being offered so that it's not just because i said so deal with it you are an untrustworthy choice maker and all of it points back toward them as people and i'm wondering because i think When it comes to parenting, so many people sort of, I don't know that they necessarily think about it this way, but I think they conceptualize their job as like raising healthy bodies. Mm. You know what I mean? Like that there's a focus on raising a healthy body that will grow and obviously more and more so lately, I think we also see like raising mentally healthy kids and all of these things too. But I'm wondering how you just conceptualize your job because essentially you're describing a totally different job than I think a lot of parents are uh, imagine themselves to have because this is a job of, I don't know. Yeah, I'm wondering how you would put it. Well, what I was going to say is I think that there's definitely been a generational switch and part of that is um, opportunity Uh, when... I'm not going to try and speak too globally. Um, I think the idea of raising a, a human's body um, is a survival mode thinking, which has been mm. totally appropriate. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Generations in this country and in the world. You're sure. trying to, my, my grandmother was one of 12 kids. I think nine of them made it to adulthood. Whoa. That was not uncommon. Yeah. Right. And that's not that long ago. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, That is not the case for my parents' generation, but they were raised by parents who were at the right. There, there is, um, it is reasonable and appropriate for many generations of humans and many nations around the world that survival is what we are trying to do and accomplish. 
the next level is emotional safety and then like emotional thriving. If you are, if you have the privilege to offer emotional thriving, it is because you are in a privileged place where survival is not all of your time. And I, I acknowledge that with gratitude. Yes, yes. There are some parents who are in that survival plane and also doing this work and mm. they are heroes because mm. it is a lot. Yeah. And it's simple, which doesn't mean it's easy. Right. It comes down to trusting that they are a person who can express themselves and are of value just because they are. Mm. Even if they are not your mini me and they don't have the same hobbies as you (laughs) and they don't love the same things you love or eat the same foods you eat or whatever. Like people, any person will come to this journey with their own images on purpose or not of what they thought it would be. Right. And, um, and some kids are going to be easier for you, for any adult to connect with than others, because they are more like you or unlike you. Sure. But if you can come to the place, if I can come to the place, if we can come to the place of allowing them to be who they are, so much of this unlearning that we have to, that, that our generation of adults is doing in their thirties and forties and fifties of, oh, I'm actually okay. There's actually yeah. nothing wrong with me. Mm -hmm. I am is maybe a journey that will be shorter for them yeah yeah (laughs) all parents make mistakes all parents blow it I for sure blow it um but my hope is that we can avoid the long journey toward there's nothing wrong with me because of who I am yeah and I think we're seeing that culturally I acknowledge the incredible challenges that are happening politically right now but we but we see that now in the kids who it doesn't occur to them to be in the closet when two generations ago right right out of the totally like that that journey has been so profound only in my own lifetime Uh um I am incredibly grateful for both the kids and the parents in our community because my children at the ages they are already know kids who are not being forced to live on a binary spectrum and identify in that way, that is not something that could have been available to lots of kids just a few years ago. And that requires sensitivity of the parents and sensitivity of the kids. And what I am grateful for selfishly is like, my kids will now never know a world where binary is the default. Right, right, right. We're the only option. Where non-binary is part of their default picture. So that is a door they're not going to have to shove open in 15 Mm. years. I think it's so, so so beautiful and so important to acknowledge that like there is an evolution culturally, we are moving the right direction, but still now there are people in survival mode. And so if you as a listener are like, well, that's really cool, Rachel. I don't have the time, money, support, resources, whatever to do any of this stuff. Like I'm ke- just keeping my kid alive. That's perfect. That's yeah. appropriate. And that's perfect. And there are plenty of people, I think, who are in a space of wanting to unpack this stuff, but feel really lost. And I feel like you've dropped so many amazing bits of wisdom for what it can look like to center a, a kid's autonomy and, um, Uh, embodied self-trust essentially from birth so that there is less to clean up later. If you have the ability, if that is something you're interested in while you're unpacking your own stuff and navigating all of these things that like your job here, if you can and want to, can look quite different. Yeah. There's that's beautiful. For doing things differently than they were done to you. Yeah. Whatever those things are, if you have the space and the opportunity to to give yourself permission to sometimes not be perfect at it. Oof, absolutely. And that's hard. Yeah. And it's been for me a journey that is the most meaningful. The number of times in the last year, especially, I don't know why this year especially, but that I I think learning to apologize to my children is the greatest gift I have ever given them 
Wow. And here's the weight of that, Jesse. That means I have something to apologize for. And that sucks. And I don't remember adults ever apologizing to me as a kid. Yeah. I think about what we're modeling that, like the comfort I bring to myself, right? In those moments where I feel terrible and I have to repair is I am modeling that everyone makes mistakes. Yeah. You make mistakes. I make mistakes that we can repair together. Yeah. That adults owe you an apology when they make mistakes too. That you are worthy. Yeah somebody repairing with you that the adults discomfort at having been wrong or whatever should never override the respect of the moment for you right like all of those things and that is how I make myself feel better when I know that I have blown it and I have to come back with an apology (laughs) Okay. You know, what's so interesting though, um, because there's like obviously a whole movement in like, you know, Disney and Pixar, we've got parents apologizing to kids for the first time. Sometimes that's the first place anyone's ever seen it. Right. Um, But my brother and I were talking about this recently that I, I said, I have a lot of memories of mom and dad apologizing to us. Mm -hmm. And some of them, like, I don't remember the issue. I do remember the apology. And what I remember is getting to roll my eyes and be like, God, this is so embarrassing, dad. Like, it's fine. And he's like, no, I shouldn't have yelled or I shouldn't, you know, whatever. And I'm like, okay, you know, I get get to like be a scoffy kid or whatever. But in those moments, obviously they stuck with me for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling respected in a way that will never go away. Feeling worthy of such a moment such an acknowledgement and knowing that it couldn't have felt good for them. I could see it didn't feel good for them, but that they honored me enough to say I lost my temper or whatever the, you know, and that is, I just feel like one of the best things they ever did. And I I don't know that they ever really thought about it or not, but it's huge. Probably did. It's really hard. (laughs) (laughs) Probably. (laughs) in it right oh and shame is so poisonous but that shame is like oh it made such a big mistake and then the best the biggest cleanser for shame is connection yeah right and like the cleansing for shame of like oh I yelled at you you weren't doing anything wrong or maybe you were yeah yeah I lost my temper I lost my ability to manage myself and now I have to now I get to come and tell you that I'm sorry yeah And that connection is what washes away the shame of I'm a terrible person. I'm a bad parent. I should Uh never love it. I'm going to add all this baggage to their life. Yeah. You don't have to ruminate because you did the repair work. The, the shame is real. And the antidote is connection always. And children are just as worthy of your connection as adults. Mic drop. Also, um, narcissism is the inability to tolerate shame. So like, a lot of families would never be able to do this because if you have like a a person who is intolerant, they're not going to be able to handle the moment and the thing. And then their kids learn to be intolerant too. Their kids learn shame is super dangerous and bad and I should avoid it at all costs because no one ever modeled that it was okay and safe just to be in it for a minute. Okay, Rachel, this was an incredible conversation. We went way over, but I am so happy to have had you on here and talk about all the things. Um, do you want people to find you? You can tell them where to find you, if so, on the internet. Uh, right now, my internet is um, mostly Instagram and threads because okay. we don't like Elon Musk all that much. Uh, sure. Yeah, I guess I'm still on Facebook. Someday, maybe there will be other things, but I'm Rachel Kimsey. I'm easy to to find. I'm, I mostly talk about um, failing at homesteading. I went yeah. and got some chickens and now I'm attempting to garden and I'm very bad at it. <laughs> um, my my work professionally is voiceover which I love um so there will be cartoons and video games and um you can hear me on CNBC sometimes I love it uh, if you want to pop in there but um that's where you find me Rachel Kimsey awesome thank you so much for being here and sharing and bouncing all this stuff around with me and everyone thank you so much for listening and I will catch you next week Hi everyone, I'm Jesse Neeland. I just want to take a moment to thank you for watching this video. I put out new episodes of my podcast every Tuesday, so be sure to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so that you don't miss those, and feel free to leave me a comment. If you are looking for more information about body neutrality or you want to work with me, you can always find me at my website, jessenealand.com, or you can purchase my book, 
Body Neutral, A Revolutionary Guide to Overcoming Body Image Issues, wherever you buy books, ebooks, or audiobooks. We can also connect on Instagram or TikTok. My handle is Jesse Neeland. And I make this podcast for free and without any sponsors or ads. So if you want to support my show, you can use the Patreon link in the show notes and know that your support is always very much appreciated. Lastly, thank you to my brother, Jason Nealon, for creating the music that plays at the beginning of the show. And thank you for listening, learning, and moving toward personal and collective body liberation. <laughs> <laughs>